I'm visiting uh, with Melvin Wade this afternoon. It's September 15th, uh, 2017. We're in the Angie DeVoe room of the Edmund Lowell Library. Uh, Melvin, if you'd please uh, say your name and then spell it for me. All right. My name is Melvin Wade, M-E-L-V-I-N-W-A-D-E. I'm a native of Greenville, Mississippi, and I was a student here uh, from 1961 uh, to 1969 at Oklahoma State University. Well, Melvin, you, you've already started answering some of my questions. So I was going <laughs> to ask you, uh, so where did you grow up? So you grew up in uh, Greenville? In, that's right. I grew up in segregated Greenville, Mississippi. Okay. Uh, at the time, Greenville was uh, about 40,000 in size. And uh, since that time, it has been reduced to about 30,000. And one of the reasons is because the uh, industries uh, and the Air Force Base that were there during my early childhood uh, left and migrated elsewhere. Okay. Would you mind telling us about your family uh, and, and what, what you did in Greenville? Uh, during your youth? My father was a job printer and uh, had his own uh, small business. My mother was a teacher at uh, O'Bannon School uh, for uh, the years that I re recall. And I was a student at Coleman High School, an all African American school. And uh, I uh, did high school there until uh, the spring of 1961. Graduated and then came to the uh, came to Oklahoma State University. And uh, I came because my mother was a woman with great foresight. She uh, knew that uh, I should leave Mississippi and, uh, you know, migrate elsewhere. And she called my dad's uh, oldest brother, uh, who was an attorney in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, Primus Calvin Wade, and he agreed to accept responsibility for my coming to Stillwater. And he was the one who actually recommended Stillwater. It was really the only school that we all could, uh, as a family, could agree on. There were just three of us. I was an only child. And we came, we uh, interviewed, and we liked it, and fortunately I was able to get uh, admitted. How, how did you get here from, from Greenville? Did you travel by, by car or by... Uh, how did you, you make the journey? Well, those were years where uh, so much travel uh, in the South was done by bus. And the years that I came here, uh, again, the desegregation of the buses had just uh, been begun. And I remember one instance where uh, someone, a bus driver, asked me to uh, sit in the back of the bus. Uh, so I would usually come by Greyhound bus, and uh, my mother would usually, you know, uh, follow the pattern of giving me a box of fried chicken, and uh, the chicken was supposed to last until <laughs> I got here. And uh, it really was uh, unusual because, uh, an unusual experience for me because uh, I was uh, seeing people I did not know, and occasionally I would be able to engage those people in friendly conversation. And um, I had a degree of reserve, but once I got talking, you know, I enjoyed talking and learning about people mm -hmm. and telling them, you know, about my own world. Uh, so the... Um, uh, so usually I would come directly here, and it was 
uh, usually an overnight kind of thing. It would usually take me until the next day to get here. So uh, would you spend the night someplace or would you just be on different buses working your way across from, from Mississippi? That's right, I would be on different buses. Uh, at that time, it was such a challenge, you know, uh, if you were African American to travel in, uh, in the South. And so coming from Mississippi and crossing into to Arkansas, for example, uh, was uh, not a safe place for anybody to stay. And of course, there were black motels, but, uh, you know, the period to me was fashioned, uh, from my perspective, was fashioned around uh, uh, dissolving barriers. And so um, I would not have necessarily wanted to stay at a black motel on the way, uh, unless it were a high quality motel. I would probably have, have uh, 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 have not been able to stay at a white motel. Indeed, the challenges were sometimes on the buses, you know, as I mentioned, uh, regarding where I would sit on the buses. And so uh, there are times, a couple of times, a person, uh, the bus driver would leave his seat and ask me to sit in a different place. But it only happened a couple of times uh, as far as my, my memory recalls. How, how would you know if a hotel or motel was a, a black motel or a a white motel, would they have a sign out, out front? Uh, certainly this was impressionistic, but you, you sort of understood from the way districts were populated. So if you traveled and you saw the makeup of the neighborhoods as you were riding, then you presume that this, uh, that a, uh, if you saw a lot of white faces, that the neighborhood was predominantly white. If you saw a lot of black faces, then you assume that the neighborhood was predominantly black. Mm -hmm. Did you ever feel unsafe while traveling or concerned uh, about your safety? Those times when the bus driver would leave his station, um, the, the typical thing was for him to sit in his seat and then uh, to announce what he wanted to announce uh, while seated in the seat. But uh, if he then got up, then that became, you know, potentially threatening. And so on those occasions, you would, uh, you would listen very carefully. But by that time, I was also infused with the uh, the momentum of the movement, and so I rarely uh, would uh, uh, would do anything other than than what I wanted to do, and um, and I was determined to take on those particular battles because of the the uh, the energy of that time period. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So you, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to take you off on that that. Uh, 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 detour, but I appreciate kind of providing perspective on, on travel at that absolutely, time. Absolutely, I mean, absolutely. Uh, no so, problem at all. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you, 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 you get approval from your mother, mm -hmm. and this is her, her brother, your uncle, uh, yes. in, in Tulsa. Uh -huh. who rec Do you know why he recommended, of, of all the places, did he just feel that, that Oklahoma State would be a, do you, know how, do you have any recollection of why he, he thought this would be a good place for you to come? That conversation probably took place between my mother and him. Okay. And I was not party to uh, to that com to those that or those conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, he could have recommended Langston, which would have been safer, but which I probably would not have agreed to. And. Um, as I've learned about Langston and the role that uh, Langston played in the desegregation of Oklahoma State University, um, I have uh, my opinion of Langston uh, with its 
very meaningful history has changed. Uh, but uh, he could have recommended the University of Oklahoma. Uh, my uncle, actually I found a picture of my uncle uh, at an event over at Langston University, and I found that to be interesting. I think back in, uh, in, in maybe 1960. Uh, but the University of Oklahoma, I had certainly heard about because I was a fan of University of Oklahoma football before I even knew anything about Oklahoma State University. We've heard rumors that they do play football at the University of Oklahoma. So, uh. <laughs> uh, but I knew uh, uh, Coach Wilkinson, Bud Wilkinson. Uh, I knew him, his reputation in the football world. Uh, sometime around that time period that, I, that we, my family was considering all of this, they were in a long win streak, something like a 49-game winning streak in football. Uh, none of the other sports I, I knew anything about. Uh, I didn't even know about Coach Iba until I got here. Okay. So, so you arrived in 61, 1961, mm -hmm. here in Stillwater. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what is your major? And so I think my original major was English. And I had a difficult experience with a professor, Berkeley. And so by the end of my freshman year, I had changed that to history. And by the time I met a few great people in, in uh, communication, in speech communication, I changed uh, my major to that, and that was my third and final major. So speech communications is, is uh, where you ended up. Where did yeah. you live when you were on campus? And I lived in, in Cordell Hall, I lived in Bennett Hall, and there was one more that I lived in. I have a picture of it, uh, but I can't recall the name of it. Okay. It was not in the fashion of most of the residence halls here, red brick and everything. It was a different... Uh, uh, composition to the residence hall, and I think it must have been a newer one. Okay, if, if you can ever show me the picture, I can identify most of the buildings, so yeah. uh, let me know. Um, um, so you you, uh, you live on campus uh, mm -hmm. while you're here. Um, uh, uh, roommates, did you select your roommates, or when I went through it was potluck, you got, you got <laughs> who you got. Did you have any choice in roommates, or, or was there any any division uh, um, that you found? Well, mine was potluck too, and uh, Dr. Lilliet Ashley from Bowley, Oklahoma, was my roommate. Uh, at the time, I didn't know that he was going to be a doctor, but I've since affirmed that in my research uh, on the on. Uh, African American students who were here during the 1960s. So you're telling me about your roommate. Um, were were um, were black and white students roommates, or were were there any restrictions on uh, roommates based on race? Are you aware of anything? I my understanding was that people were grouped together by race, and that the university knew. Uh, you know, who the, the racial composition of the students who came and that they assigned students, you know, on the basis of race. race. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. okay. So I don't recall uh, white roommates until uh, I was in later years, you know, certainly beyond my sophomore year when, when that happened. My uh, roommates off campus included Jean Reed, who is here now. And as I think there were uh, either three or four of us who were rooming together off campus. Uh, I recall roommates in a newer structure. Uh, I just have a recollection of 
being inside in 1963 when President Kennedy was assassinated. And we heard the news. And at that time, I was rooming with uh, a student from Oklahoma City named Alonzo Kelly. Uh, I believe one of my other roommates was named Frank, and he also was from Oklahoma City. And I recall rooming uh, at one point with, uh, with Joe James, the, uh, the great Oklahoma State wrestler who was uh, the first African-American heavyweight champion in wrestling here. So a number of different roommates at different locations over a period of time, yes, both uh, on and off campus. That's right. Okay. But the, the only mixed, uh, racially mixed group was off campus. Off campus. Mm -hmm. okay. um, what on-campus activities did you become involved with? So you had your, your coursework, which changed as you moved into speech communications, but what, what kind of other on-campus activities were you involved with? So I was drawn to the ones where uh, af African-American athletes were prominent. And then maybe once I started, then I would be open to just uh, broader participation. And uh, I certainly attended a lot of the wrestling events and gloried in the, uh, several of the individual wrestlers, uh, certainly Joe as my roommate was uh, very important. I enjoyed all of his victories and ultimately he would go on to, uh, to win the, uh, the, rest of the National uh, Wrestling Championship. Uh, but then there, were, uh, there was your hero, Yutaki, who I'm certainly, I'm sure I'm butchering his name, but he was from uh, Japan. And uh, certainly it was every time he, he wrestled, uh, uh, you know, I certainly rooted for him too. Bobby Douglas, uh, during my later years, sometimes I think maybe I was in graduate school by that time, but uh, Bobby Douglas was certainly one of my favorites too. Basketball, uh, Jim King was here uh, under Coach Iva. And, uh, you know, I rooted for him and enjoyed his playing style. He was a very smooth person, a type of athlete. And uh, let me see if there were any other athletes. I didn't do baseball. Uh, football? Did you attend football uh, games? Now, that was curious. Oh, track, too. Track. Uh, I ran a year of track here and met uh, just wonderful, you know, uh, contemporaries, you know, that, uh, uh, that I hope I'll, I'll be encouraging them to come back next year for the, the reunion that we're going to work on. Uh, Ray Mitchell uh, was a half miler, I believe, from Chickasha. Uh, Waddell Hollis was, a, I think, both a football player and a track person. I think he was hers. And Wardell lives in San Antonio, Texas now. Um, uh, Ray Bothwell was a 440 runner and uh, was a conference champion one year. Uh, and there were several of the white uh, athletes uh, that were friends, you know, Charlie Strong, uh, who was a quarter miler, uh, was a friend. Uh, and uh, the Perry twins were uh, also here. Arnold Droke was here, and Arnold ran on the two mile relay unit at a time when, uh, when the unit was one of the best in the country. And Arnold, uh, there, Arnold and Wardell actually became either colonels or lieutenant colonels in the U.S. Army. And so uh, 
that I admired, have admired, you know, their careers over that that time. Uh, I was a member of uh, Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity after I believe uh, sixty three. And the fraternity played an important role in my graduation, just giving me the kind of structure and friendship uh, patterns that you need in order to be successful, uh, so that it helps when you're a part of a group. And so uh, sometimes maybe when you are thinking, well, you know, let me go to this party, then the fact that people are uh, announcing study hours helps you ultimately, even though you don't see it at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what event did you run in track? You said you ran track. What, what was your uh, event? Well, I was a, a, a lower quality uh, quarter mile. Quarter mile, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. All right. And let me see, what is the other thing that I did. Well, politically, I became active. Uh, uh, Ron Stevens, who is here for the weekend, uh, uh, started a newspaper called The Drama, which apparently was one of the first uh, off-campus newspapers, underground newspapers in the country. And he asked me, I'm thinking around 1963, to write an essay on race. And I uh, stayed up either a night or two doing it and uh, just really enjoyed what I came up with and how uh, he responded to it. He put it on the, if I'm remembering correctly, <laughs> there are always the possibility that memories can be dulled by uh, the passing of time. But if I remember, remember correctly, he put it on the front page of that particular issue of the drama. And uh, it was a way of distinguishing myself from, uh, from maybe my, my classmates and my college mates and made me uh, happy to be able to do so. And then my... Uh, Second political act was an interesting one. Uh, one of my most important mentors was a professor uh, by the name of Brad Brown. And Brad was a, um, an, a member of the NAACP who was deeply committed to the NAACP wherever he lived. He uh, just was in Florida and he, uh, oh man, I think he may still live in Florida, but uh, Brad was uh, so committed to the NAACP that at times it was difficult to tell he was not African-American. And so one day he and I were in a discussion and he revealed to me that the university had different uh, housing lists for uh, different racial groups of students. So at one, I had no idea that this was taking place. So he, uh, he mentioned this to me, and after I saw the impact that it had on him, as he was telling me, his face became all red. And I said, well, why is this a but different order and a different significance to him than it is to me. And I said, maybe this is something I should be concerned about too. So I mentioned it to uh, my best associates, uh, Margaret Williams, who would become my wife, and uh, Nimrod Chapel, who was uh, an activist even after I had gone. Uh, Cynthia Chapel, his uh, Cynthia Emery, uh, who became Cynthia Chapel, his his wife, and Glenn Show, and uh, we decided something needed to be done. 
So we made an appointment with President Khan, and we told him he was not quite yet president. He was going to be installed, uh, I believe, the next week. So he was he he had come from he had been the dean of arts and sciences on campus, uh -huh. and right, right and in 1966, 65, 66, he then he was. Uh, promoted but given the permission That's the position right. of president yeah so this was 1966 okay and his he was scheduled to be uh, installed right out in front of the library that's where all the chairs were mm -hmm. and we had had this meeting with him a brief time before I think it may have been the week preceding everything but you know uh, it might have been a little before that, but it was old. It, it was, it was before it enough for us to be aware that it was in, an impending installation. And we said to President Khan, "We'd like you to resolve this issue before your installation, because there are students on campus who are planning a protest at your installation." if you do not, if you are unable, or if the campus is unable to resolve this issue. The day of his installation, President Khan, uh, in the Daily O'Collegian, uh, uh, published his, his statement that uh, the housing list would be ended. Now, from Professor Kopecki's book, it does not seem that the housing list were actually ended, but the mere fact that it was stated gave us a great victory. And it kind of energized us and made us uh, meet to develop an agenda of what we were going to do uh, in support of uh, improving racial issues that Oklahoma State University. One of the things that we chose to do was to start uh, Black Heritage Week. And though Professor uh, Kopecki's book, I suspect she did more of her research in 1968 than, you know, at other, t in other years. And so she, um, she seems to have not known that there was a Black Heritage Week the year before she claims the first one took place. So I was the coordinator for the first one. And uh, that year I called, which was, uh, I believe, 1966. Um, it was after President uh, Khan's program. So. I'm a little confused on the exact date, but um, we, I managed to call Adam Clayton Powell as he was traveling through the United States. Adam Clayton Powell was the most important congressional leader who was of African American ancestry during the 20th century. Congressman from New York. Congressman from Harlem. From Harlem. In New York. In New York. And uh, then the chair of, if memory serves me correctly, the House and Education and Labor Committee. So he had been deposed uh, from Congress by this time, censured, and uh, happened to remove himself uh, to the Bahamas because if he was in New York uh, or in Washington, D.C., he would have been arrested. But somehow he could travel through California. And so he was at one of the most radical uh, uh, programs in higher education at that time. He was visiting the campus of San Francisco State University. And uh, those of us who were in liberal politics campus politics like you and myself, we remember San Francisco State and how, uh, how important it was. And of course, it wasn't uh, very far from Berkeley. 
and uh, Berkeley had its influence on us here as students. You know, certainly the free speech movement, for example. And we talked about uh, uh, Timothy Leary, bringing Timothy Leary to campus. We t uh, Timothy Leary, uh, the LSD advocate. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about Gabriel Bahani, who was a death of God speaker. And uh, we didn't necessarily believe these things, but we thought students were, uh, that they should be exposed to these things. Were you part of the forums uh, committee? Um, there was a committee on campus that brought in speakers. So this was uh, an addition to that. These were other, other individuals that you were that's considering. Right. Okay. That's right. Okay. So um, I had a lot to learn. So when I came here, I had never done this type of thing, you know, organizing a, a speaking event. So that uh, first year, uh, I asked my friends, and I don't remember exactly who I asked, but I asked my friends in Student Senate to give me the power to make telephone calls uh, in organizing this event. So if you support me, would you please back me uh, so that I would have opportunity to call around the nation and ask people to come to, the, to Oklahoma State University. And that was how I got the ability to call uh, Adam Clayton Powell. Little did I know that this would come to the attention of the Board of Regents. And so somehow there were policies being made to prevent quote, radical speakers from coming to the university. And, and these were policies at the, at the Board of Regents level that, that you think? Professor Kopecki is my source on this. Okay. And uh, in the Equal Opportunity book, mm -hmm. uh, because I had no uh, knowledge of this at the time, I'm reluctant to okay. speak about it. And my, uh, my own information is very limited uh, okay. about this. I do recall that it got attention in, I believe, the Daily Oklahoman, if not the Tulsa uh, world. world. And uh, so because of the backlash to this prospects, we had to give up on uh, Adam Clayton Powell. And which was a difficult thing for me to do at that point. But we did subsequently invite for that year uh, Asa Spaulding. Asa Spaulding was then president and owner, CEO of the largest African American insurance company in the country, uh, North Carolina Mutual uh, Life Insurance. And we also invited a student from Yale University Law School who was the second African-American Rhodes Scholar in the nation. They both came just for their expenses and, uh, and made their speeches. But then the next year, uh, President Kahn and A. Hesser must have had uh, epiphanies because they recognized that there was something important about uh, supporting uh, the Black Heritage Week. My, my ex-wife, uh, Margaret Williams, at the time ran that event with the support of the rest of us. And she had the brilliant idea of inviting uh, Melvin Tolson uh, or doing this in the honor of Malcolm Tolson. Professor Tolson had just died uh, between the time that, that I did uh, the first uh, Black Heritage Week and the second Black Heritage Week. He was her mentor while she studied at Langston. This is Melvin Tolson Sr., I believe. This is Melvin Tolson Sr. Right, and, and he had an extended career at Langston and then at some point, did he go to Texas after at, Langston? At the, 
the t Texas one at Wiley College is the one that's the subject of the movie starring uh, uh, Denzel, Denzel Washington. Washington. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, somehow he managed to uh, encourage uh, students to, uh, to learn how to debate and then to arrange for them to compete with the national, the U.S. national champions. And they incredibly won. Mm -hmm. And okay. so, so he, so Melvin uh, Tolson Sr. had inspired your wife as a mentor. That's okay, so right. I'm sorry. So continue. That's right. So continue with uh, your, your uh, description of, um, of early Black uh, history, or uh, was it Black history? Okay. Mm -hmm. So the uh, Professor Tolson, before his his death comes to the university and speaks. I did not know, and most of the black community, student community here, did not know he was here. Uh, but he spoke here, and then shortly after that, he passed. And Margaret had the brilliant idea of inviting, of designing a program that would be in tribute to him for Black Her Heritage Week. And that's the one that got more attention and more support. And it may have been because it was seen as more academic than mine, which was seen as political. And yet, in some respects, hers was certainly at least as political as mine, and perhaps more political. That's why it was such a brilliant strategy. Who was the speaker, do you remember? And uh, there were f at least four speakers. And the only one that I can recall was Professor Joy Flash. Professor Flash uh, spent almost entirely her career her entire career at, uh, at Langston. And uh, I believe she still lives in that community. She would now be about 85, 86 years old. And I talked to her earlier this year, long distance. Uh, she is the one who, uh, whose documents I recall are on mine. It's something like her, her, uh, her talk is, is somewhere on mine. Uh, the others, time just fails me, but uh, it was such a wonderful event to, it was the first event that I can recall that I ever attended that was entirely devoted to an African American. And it probably was the first conference devoted to Melvin Tolson in Oklahoma. It may have been the first in the nation. So uh, I'm not sure about first in the nation, but certainly in Oklahoma. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, let me backtrack mm -hmm. briefly. You mentioned this university list that was kind of a, a part of your inspiration in, in getting involved with political activity. This was a list of residence areas or residence apartments uh, off campus. Is that what uh, this, this list was about? Um, so these were residences uh, that were off campus that were available for rent to uh, Oklahoma State students. And it was a, a segregated list. Right? Absolutely, two separate lists. Two separate lists. One for African Americans, one for uh, white men. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure everyone was clear about the the intent of these lists. So these are university produced lists that obviously segregate the population into different housing arrangements in the city of Stillwater. So my assumption is that a um, a person who wanted to rent their property, would contact an office here at the university. And that office would then be open to them explaining that this particular list should not be uh, circulated 
uh, and available to all students, but only to groups that were selected by the person who was renting the property. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, perhaps there was some overlap, you know, of the list, but they were uh, separate. And somehow Brad, found, Brad Brown, uh, Dr. Brad Brown, who was then a member of one of the science faculties, may have been biology, he found out about it. And as a committed civil rights worker, he said, you know, this is offensive mm -hmm. and we must find a way to end it and mention it to me. And, you know, the uh, students who were in my little group, <laughs> together we were able to, uh, to work on eliminating right. the list. Uh, at least as open policy. As, as a university sponsored That's right. activity. Right. That's right. right. But according to Professor Kopecki, the list remained. Hmm. Um, so, so you're a student here. Um, what opportunities did you have uh, on campus while you were here that you remember? Uh, things that uh, uh, you hadn't thought about maybe that just arrived you, uh, on your doorstep or what, but what kind of opportunities did, were made available to you as a student here? Well, aside from uh, Ron Stevens, you know, and the drama, uh, which I thought, you know, was an important you know, accomplishment for me uh, in terms of my evolution as an activist, then I also had the benefit of some people in my own department, the communications department, that kind of took me under their wing. Uh, the first person was uh, Professor uh, uh, Lee Gilstrap. Professor Gilstrap, we would call him Colonel Gilstrap. And uh, I don't remember students calling him Professor. I think he encouraged people to call him Colonel Gilstrap. He was a World War I hero. And uh, he was kind of folksy in his approach. Uh, but he also did me the great favor of saying to me that you are the best student in this class. And I think it was about halfway through the course, and it made such an impact on me for the remainder of that semester that whenever I uh, did homework, his homework came first. Mm -hmm. And um, the words were instantly uh, transformative, I guess is the best word to uh, say. Uh, no teacher at Oklahoma State had even come close to ever saying those words to me. But in addition, he, uh, he encouraged me to, uh, to join the debate team. Now, I joined and quickly revealed myself not to be a good debater. But at the same time, I found out that people also did oratory. And so um, I worked very hard on the oratory. Initially, Professor Dale Stockton was important there. A year or two after uh, Dr. King had made the celebrated um, uh, I Have a Dream speech, uh, Dale Stockton had that speech on the agenda for his class. And if I remember correctly, either I took the class or had some responsibility for the, uh, for the class. And uh, to hear the words of the I Have a Dream speech, that was the first time occurrence for me. 
So what he did was very important uh, in my opinion. Not many people were uh, knowledgeable of the African American experience at that time and would have had the courage to place something like that on their agenda for the class. So we, uh, if I remember correctly, it was a rhetoric speech, and a rhetoric class, and we actually analyzed the speech. The, um, Gail Bill, B-E-I-L, was also very instrumental. In 1958, uh, she was white and she had, I believe, won the same oratorical contest that I'm talking about. Uh, I, I represented the university at the uh, oratorical contest, the national oratorical contest that she won. And if I remember correctly, I think she told me she won it in 1958. And I competed a few years later. So she was my coach for that. She would listen to me, even to have somebody listen to a speech that I had written at that time was important to giving me a sense of belonging here at the university. Uh, when I went to Windsor, uh, Oklahoma, we, Winsler, Canada, uh, where the competition took place. She was the one who was sort of like the personal guide for me and uh, the, the person who's, who constantly reminded me that uh, she was taking care of my best interests. And uh, so she was very important because of that. Uh, no other academic department, you know, reached out to me in that, that way to make me feel special. And then, uh, trying to remember, there was a third person uh, who was, oh, that's, I guess that is. So, so Dale Stockton, uh, Colonel Gilstrap, and Gail Bill. Gail, I would work with in my professional career. Uh, at the uh, University of Texas at Austin. So there I was uh, a lower level faculty member um, at the university. And so uh, I uh, had I started an event called Juneteenth at the Capitol. Juneteenth is the date that uh, people in Texas uh, African Americans began to celebrate uh, emancipation, and uh, in and the celebrations have become uh, strategically placed enough so that they're celebrated uh, in many states uh, throughout the country. Uh, Juneteenth is the largest. African American emancipation celebration in the nation. So when President Lincoln decided to go through with emancipation, to all of the southern or seceded states, he sent generals. And the dates the generals arrive in those states tend to be the dates that they celebrate African American emancipation. And because Juneteenth is uh, celebrated in a warm month, its popularity has extended, you know, uh, widely over the country. And there are even uh, states on the other side of the Mississippi who, uh, who tend to celebrate uh, Juneteenth. So uh, I worked with others to initiate a celebration at the Capitol, and Gail Bill, who I had met here at Oklahoma State, uh, had moved by then to Marshall, Texas. And she was one of those who actually is a Tolson scholar. She's, uh, she's very aware of what Dr. Tolson had done.
because Wiley College is located in that's Marshall, right. Texas. That's right. Yeah. And uh, she had known uh, Mr. James Farmer, uh, the president of the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, before, long before I knew him. So I had, after finding out that he was a Texan, I invited him. And then Gail said, uh, you know I know him, don't you? <laughs> and then explained to me uh, her connection with, with Wiley and uh, how she had, had, uh, had met Dr. Tolson uh, early on and had done research on him. And so I asked her for her help in working with uh, Dr. Don Carlton, who is the archivist at the University of uh, Texas at Austin. And th at the time, he was director of something called the Texas History Research Center there. And uh, he had the resources to be able to uh, professionally protect those papers and to pay, uh, pay for the papers. And, uh, they, and Gail helped with the uh, negotiation because she knew him better than I knew him. I had just met him for that one occasion. Uh, and so what we typically did is we awarded people who had distinguished uh, Texas histories who were African Americans uh, at the Capitol, and we gave those awards at the Capitol, and usually would invite uh, politicians to present the awards whenever we could and whenever they were willing. So, um, Gail, Gail and I have a long history. And that started here right at here. the uh, university. So when you ask about special kinds of things, then, you know, those take on special significance. Uh, Colonel Gilstrap saying, uh, just matter of factly, you're the best student in this class. And then uh, maneuvering to get me involved with the oratory uh, team when I did not know that there was even an oratory team on the campus. And, uh, and then uh, Dale Stockton and the I Have a Dream speech. Now, Dale was, was murdered. And so uh, shortly after uh, his class was through, for, he visited uh, or had an appointment at a hotel in Dallas. And he was murdered in the hotel. And uh, yet, he was a brilliant teacher. Uh, and the memory of his teaching was stamped on me. In many respects, I would say he was the best teacher that I had uh, in terms of his competency here at the university, uh, at Oklahoma State University. You, you shared some of the opportunities that uh, came your way while you were here. What were some of the challenges that you confronted? You, you, you know, we talked briefly about the university list for residences off campus, but what, what other challenges did you face as a student here in the early 60s, mid 60s? By the time I had met Dr. Kahn, it was important for me to, uh, to find ways to express my newfound activism. And from what I could tell, President Kahn and Vice President Hesse seemed to make that difficult. So the support that one would hope to get and you know and that I got from people like Colonel Gilstrap and uh, Gail Bill and 
uh, not quite Dale Stockton, but it's only because he was murdered so soon after uh, I had the opportunity to take his class. They, their encounters made me feel special and made me feel empowered. President Khan, particularly after the incident I described happened, made me, uh, or made me feel like he regarded me as a nemesis and therefore became my nemesis. And uh, so I never felt like I could invite the president of the university to meet Stan Sanders when he came to the campus. Or if he had come out in Clayton Power, that would just not was not going to happen. Uh, or to meet Asa Spaulding. And so those were a part of the challenges. You know, here you you discovered this new field uh, that you like. And yes, it isn't a university department. It isn't a university program, but it's an important part of your learning. And it will become the basis for the work that you do over your lifetime. So the skills that we're talking about, when, when I was uh, able to become the inaugural director of the Center for Black Studies at the University of California at Santa Barbara, the only thing I had to prepare me for those responsibilities was my activism here at the university, at Oklahoma State University. And so to have that not supported uh, because of the background, and I think this really was a background issue, uh, Dr. Kahn did not understand us and did not understand our background. And we did not understand his background. And I never thought he was insincere. I thought that he believed in the actions that he took and that in his mind those were uh, important ways to protect the university. But it suggested that the institution was more important to him than the students. And I think it's an important lesson to know that the students are what makes up the institution and that they must be protected, they must be nurtured, they must be encouraged. Uh, as other uh, elements, components of the university must be protected. And if any of those components are not respected and encouraged and nurtured and strengthened by your actions, if they are somehow left out because of the way you grew up and the fact that these, some of these people may have been absent from your background, and from the, the interactions of the community that you grew up in. That is a problem to the development of the institution. And so um, I think that was uh, a very crucial barrier that um, we had to deal with. Professor Berkeley in that first class that I took in English. English. I thought there was a letter grade difference. I thought he gave me a C and I thought at least a B. And I was pretty confident in the classes that, that I thought I had the skills to, um, to excel in and I was pretty frank 
if I thought I was in the, the wrong class, and there were times where, uh, where I suddenly was in over my head. But the fact, I think it's important for faculty to help students understand why um, there is a difference in their assessment and why you come away with the feeling that other students were given a fairer assessment than you. And at the time, because of his background again, I don't think, I never got the feeling that Professor Berkeley was interested in meeting with me. Uh, I was just a student in his class, and as far as he was concerned, a cipher. Um, you were drawn into political activity in part because of, of civil rights issues. Absolutely. Um, uh, are you aware of other issues that are going on on campus at the same time? Uh, groups involved with free speech, groups involved with uh, concerns about the war in Vietnam. Um, is there any kind of overlap or, or interaction with those other groups then? I do believe that there were separate racial spheres of activity on the campus when I was here. And that um, I was enabled, you know, as the FATEX uh, reunion uh, suggests that uh, um, I was able to cross into both of those spheres. And the spheres were not uh, overlapping spheres of activity. So when I called uh, uh, Adam Clayton Powell, I, I think I entered some of those separate spheres uh, so that Powell made me aware of the free speech issue. And the sociology department led a, um, a political event that was actually right outside the library. The library was the primary stage for the speeches that, that they led. And we as students were present there. There were some of us who spoke and uh, uh, I think Glenn Schultz, representing our little small group, which will go on to become the nucleus for the Black Student Organization, I think uh, Glenn spoke at that gathering. And uh, it was one of the few times that Blacks and Whites, in terms of politics, on a public stage like that, um, interacted. And so we were by no means front and center at this boycott, but we were given, for the first time, I think I recall, an opportunity to uh, have our spheres connect with each other. And that was right outside this, this uh, library here on the uh, steps of, or, or the platform that uh, right outside. By the, by the fountain area, that, that uh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, the patio. That's right. And um, when those spheres crossed, it was usually something very important and a very important time in, uh, in terms of the way we saw things. So that was free speech. Vietnam, um, Chick Dambach, and uh, a student who is deceased now uh, by the name of Bill Dawson were my initial sources for information about the Vietnam War. Chick was a graduate student in uh, communications and Bill also was a graduate student in communications. And they would come and talk about the war and I 
just listen kind of non-committally at the outset. And then it began to make sense to me uh, over time. So they were certainly informed much earlier than, than I was. But as I listened and then began to see the things that were taking place in the university administration, I was made aware that there were parallels between the way our national government was operating and the way our university administration were, uh, was operating. And um, so I became interested in their issues. But at, and, and so I made a decision not to engage in the Vietnam War. Didn't discuss it with my family or anything like that, but just made a personal decision to, uh, to not be involved in the war. So this must have been again after Dr. Khan is, uh, is installed. And at that point, I, um, I've decided, and so in 1968, I get this invitation from uh, Dr. Krebs who is then chair of the communi speech communications department. Uh, Senator Fred Harris has uh, asked if anybody wants to be uh, involved in supporting his administration in Washington. Well, I had never been to Washington, D.C. So it's kind of fascinating now to think that uh, in these rather small worlds that I had been in, that there is an opportunity now to engage in a much more important world. So I um, decided, you know, I'm going to accept the opportunity to go to Washington, you know, for uh, a year. And while I'm in Washington, Dr. King is assassinated. So that transformative act, I cannot understand how a man of nonviolence could be subjected to that type of treatment. Uh, I understand Malcolm X, you know, because his approach is so radically different. But Dr. King, how does that make sense? And so, uh, once that happens, you know, and just seeing the plumes of smoke, uh, I had a roommate in Washington and we had just gone to see Dr. King for the first time in my life, um, the Sunday before he was assassinated. So at that point, he comes to the Washington Cathedral, which is uh, this very large structure uh, church outside of uh, D.C. And Dr. King is there, and we're hoping he would just give one of those stem winders. Well, it was a rel relatively tempered speech, and so he, there isn't much of the, you know, the feedback that exists between the audience. It's predominantly white. And to the best of my knowledge, I didn't, other than my roommate and myself, I don't remember seeing anybody uh, African-American there. And um, so you could tell he was tired, Dr. King was tired, but then to see him assassinate. So the first day, people, as we go through uh, Washington, D.C., uh, we see all these people who were trying to find out the facts. And this was the period where they had uh, transistor radios, and, and they were much like, I guess, cell phones now. And so people are listening to the radio station, trying to get the news. And so it's very quiet. The very next day, all hell busts loose. And at that point, uh, 
people uh, are engaged in anti-government uh, activity, I would say, would be a fair statement. And then maybe the following day or soon after that, we have uh, boycotts in the streets. We have uh, tanks in the streets. The army has been deployed over uh, the capital, and then a curfew is issued. And for somebody who's grown up in the United States, even in segregated uh, territory, this still is unusual because there are actually people with rifles out there and with, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, gear. So, uh, as, I, as best I can interpret it, this was enough to, to really uh, make me uh, change my position on the war. So I come back and I am a black draft resistor. The only black draft resistor I was aware of at that time, there may have been others, but um, uh, Jim Gilchrist, or was Joe Gilchrist was his name, is the person that uh, I've become aware of and, you know, I meet with him on occasions, you know, and ask his advice. But the Unitarian minister who I, I can't, for the love of me, I can't remember his name. I met him because he prevailed upon me to do a Malcolm Boyd play for his congregation. And uh, I was one of the characters, I think it was about a three person play. Uh, I'm not sure of that, but that's my recollection. And so we did the Malcolm Boyd play. And, and that's here in Stillwater. Yes, that was, uh, that was, I have a recollection of a coffee house or uh, some place that was off campus maybe acting as a coffee house. The, the Wesley Foundation, the Methodist Student Center had a it coffee been, house it and they had, it, a, had a larger auditorium with a stage upstairs. I think that was probably it. And uh, I was just over there last night to hear about their new building plans. and. I think it was the Wesley uh, Foundation uh, place. And so that was my only connection to this uh, Unitarian preacher. But he did me the favor of a lifetime, white, white preacher, did me the favor of a lifetime by recognizing when I came back that I did not know a great deal about how to maneuver through the process of being inducted into the draft. And so he asked me to meet him and then he explained to me what I was up against. He said, don't ignore the letter when it comes to you. Uh, he said, uh, I'm going to explain the activities that you should go through. And then at the very end, they will ask you to step forward. Do not take the step forward or you will be in the army. And um, I did, you know, when I was drafted, I did exactly what he said. Uh, I kept in touch with him through that process. And he arranged for an attorney in Oklahoma City uh, through the American Friends Service Commission, uh, Committee to handle my legal case. I regret today that I didn't say thank you to either the preacher or the lawyer. But the lawyer made it possible for me not to have to travel between here and Oklahoma City while my case was proceeding through the courts. And then just out of the blue, the different uh, protests that were against the war that were being staged on college campuses over the nation caused uh, President Nixon 
to declare a six-month moratorium on the prosecution of draft resistors. My case comes up during those six months. I think Joe's case does not come up. I, I, I'm not certain of that exactly, but I got the impression that somebody in this very, very small group of people actually went to jail. And, uh, and I didn't. And uh, I thought I was going. My family did. My wife's family thought that, you know, that that was likely. And it caused uh, trouble for me. Were you trying to be a conscientious objector CO status or a, a different classification? So I don't think, again, my thoughts had proceeded that far until the six-month moratorium had come up. And then I had a few months left before, maybe six months left before I would uh, be too old in jail. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to apply because I was suddenly in the spotlight now for a conscientious objectorship. But the problem was that um, by this time, I think my only way out, you know, I could no longer do deferments. And so uh, I did apply for a CO. Um, and my case then was referred back to Mississippi. And the Mississippi Draft Board then contacted my mother uh, to determine whether or not uh, I should be given a CO status. And my mother was terribly conflicted. And so she uh, said, no, I don't think he's a conscientious objector. I think he's confused. And, uh, and that blew that. <laughs> uh, were there any other causes? For free speech, the I mentioned Gabriel Bahani and, and, and uh, uh, Timothy Leary. Mm -hmm. And those were the two other than Adam Clayton Powell that I was aware of. We talked about it incessantly, but I think the people who had the, the, the greatest insight were the people who were working on speaker-related pro projects and mine were exclusively the ones that I've described, you know, while I was here. Uh, one of the speakers who came to campus uh, informed me about black studies, that there was such a thing that existed. And it was, of course, a very important discovery. So there's an African-American movie actress now named Nia Long. And she was in a lot of the, or some of the Eddie Murphy movies. Uh, and uh, Neil Long's father was named, uh, is named Daughtry Long. And uh, people started calling him Doc Long, uh, short for Daughtry. And Daughtry Long, after a poetry reading on the campus, attended one of our parties. And when he heard, he asked about what was taking place on the campus, and we told him uh, about uh, the political climate here, free speech, and I'm sure other issues came up. But uh, he also mentioned this term, black studies, and he said, uh, uh, you ought to really uh, get interested in black studies. It may have come about because uh, of the, we had told him about Adam Clayton Powell too, and uh, about Adam Clayton Powell's passing through uh, San Francisco State. So he may have said, uh, well, that isn't the only thing that is being born at San Francisco State be aware that the first black studies department in the country is being born 
at San Francisco State University. And uh, immediately when I heard the term black studies, I mean, that was like magic to us, like a magic word. So I um, asked uh, my colleagues, you know, with this committee that was the nucleus to the black student organization that exists now, I asked them if, uh, if we should, you know, do something about black studies on the campus. And so ultimately we talked about it and uh, Patrick Riggs, who was the son of Professor James Riggs in the Department of Humanities on the campus at the time, took it seriously and he asked his dad, <laughs> Uh, would you be willing to, to help the students out and teach this course uh, on black studies that was being proposed, in a, informally pro, uh, proposed by us, the black students committee. And Professor Riggs surprised us all by accepting the responsibility. And I think his course was the first Black Studies course on campus. What department was he in, do you remember? I, oh, Humanities, you said, mm -hmm. Humanities. Okay. Yeah, he and Cyclone Covey were, uh, were uh, the students who we knew, and Cyclone Covey because of his whirlwind style, and uh, Professor Riggs, who was much more laid back and generally seemed to be more open to uh, student ideas, and so we wound up teaching the course because Professor Riggs, he didn't know anything about black studies, but uh, to this day I'm grateful to him for opening that responsibility. So I had no idea that the advocate, the person who was at San Francisco State, who was promoting this uh, approach of black studies in this generation. You know, after black, you know, black studies had been initiated by uh, people like uh, W.B. Du Bois and Carter G. Woodson, who was the so-called father of Negro history. Uh, but in this, it, all those things had kind of faded out and faded into uh, something other than whatever the opposite of prominence is, and oblivion, I guess. And so, um, in our textbooks, we never saw any anybody of, who was black who we could be proud of. We would be taught, you know, that the legacy was slavery, and there wasn't much beyond slavery. Um, the knowledge I had gained since uh, emanates from, well, no, I guess for me, I was aware of Dr. Woodson because my high school teacher uh, introduced that information. But uh, the real knowledge comes after this point. You, you said there was someone at San Francisco State who kind of inspired that. Who, who was that individual? That was Dr. Nathan Hare. Okay. And he had a wife, uh, Dr. Julia Hare, who I think she has a PhD. He had a PhD. He was a sociologist. And he got started at Langston University. I think that's where he got his first degree, at Langston University. Winds up at Howard University. Uh, then the students at at San Francisco State become aware of that and ask him to come from Howard to San Francisco State, which has either a black president or a very radical white liberal president. And that's how the first modern black studies department gets started with this guy from Langston, brilliant man, sociologist, uh, kind of laying out the foundation of what black studies is supposed to be about. 
And uh, so the so when I find out about him, I'm very interested. And to the extent that I've been able to gain knowledge, I'm reading that knowledge as a lay person because I think I'm actually going to jail. The J. Edgar Hoover, this was last year's of the J. Edgar Hoover FBI. And so in here in Oklahoma, they have uh, put a person uh, to surveil my wife and myself. And um, they try to convince me and her that I would be best off, um, you know, because I'm still vulnerable. They don't know that I've applied for a CO. Um, and they would say I'm best off uh, uh, accepting their offer to have everything wiped off the board if I would just join the army. I still like the army and don't want, don't relish the idea of being ordered around in the frame, in the context of uh, a military army. And uh, still, I guess, mobilized by uh, the fact that Dr. King has been assassinated. Uh, Having the lies that people were telling about the U.S. Army uh, revealed to me by Chick and, and uh, Bill, and deciding that no, this is the wrong direction for me, uh, I, you know, I'm really not interested in doing the Army thing. Curiously, I have a son who is a military person. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and uh, you know, I find myself several years later at uh, West Point Military Academy where he's in school rooting for Army. <laughs> <laughs> well. So I don't think I was involved, I can't remember being involved in any other issues than those three. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with the, the Race Relations Committee? Uh, this was about 1965. Apparently on campus there was a race relations committee. I don't know I, anything else about it. Um, I did not know, but you know, I would ask uh, Earl Mitchell, Dr. Mitchell, or uh, Dr. Brad Brown. Brad, I hope, is going to be a member of the committee. I've asked him to be a member of the committee, and I think he, he, he will be willing to do that. Uh, so. The, the two of them will be deeply involved, as will Dr. Kurtzy, with the event next year. Next year. Um, Dr. Mitchell is a wonderful source of history. I would imagine that the white liberal faculty who were connected to the boycott not the boycott, but the event right out oh, in front of the library. Yeah, of the library. I would think that those would have been the people who would have been involved. Uh, so that Brad Brown, uh, from their side, people like Margaret Brooks, uh, Mary Roberger, uh, I would think those would be the people that would be involved with that. And remember, there are these separate universes that are difficult uh, to cross. So here for Fatags, um, the, I'm the one who is the, the real link between the two. And so I invited Harold Fields, who was a senator at that time. It's possible he may know, uh, at least have heard about it too. But we are the only two here. Do you remember the visit by Julian Bond? Bond Julian Bond in 1967. Yeah, I uh, do. so he was a speaker who came, uh, was allowed to come to campus. Uh, That's right. They destroyed the moment, however, by inviting John Tower, the conservative senator from uh, Texas, to be here uh, during the same time frame. 
And so uh, we were actually thinking about, we were real happy that, uh, uh, that Julian Bond was here, but we were disappointed that John Tower was here. And um, around the same time, uh, the singer Andy Williams was here too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, are you aware of the Johnny Bright incident, which happened here in 1951? Uh, I didn't know it at the time, but because the uh, the research that I did, you know, on the bios unearthed it, Johnny Earth and uh, Johnny Bright, mm -hmm. and you know, it's it's a disappointing moment, you know, in the history of the the university to have this potential all-American football player come here with the target, you know, it, it just goes completely against, you know, what amateur sports should be about. And the university suffered from it. That incident was 1951, so a little over 10 years, 11 years before you arrive here. Um, uh, Drake University comes to visit our campus for a football game. Mm -hmm. Drake, we're part of the Missouri Valley Conference at that point. Drake leaves the Missouri Valley Conference after that season. That's right. Uh, in, in much, uh, in most part, in fact, exclu almost exclusively because of that incident. Um, and do you know that uh, they've been much more prominent in other sports? You know, that, uh, that the problems in football affected the whole trajectory of their athletic schedule. And never again a major football power in the country because of the Johnny Bright incident. But basketball, other sports have continued. But that's football. Right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when you came here, you weren't aware of that of, of that event. No. But later. They wouldn't have wanted that. And, right. and the apology didn't happen until way after we had gone. So 25 years later, so that would have been, I think, in the 1970s when the university issues its apology. Mm -hmm. One of the presidents uh, before Burns Hargis uh, initiated. That was in the 1990s. Was that the 1990s? It was over 40 years after the event. Yeah, um, yeah. So. Yeah, a long time. In fact, it may have been. It, it was a long time. It was a long, long time. time coming. That's uh, right. So, um, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to mention some names here. Um, mm -hmm. Oliver Willem uh, would have been president before Com. Do you remember any interaction with President Wilhelm at all? No. No. Okay. <laughs> or President Bennett. Or President Bennett. He he was uh, yeah he, he deceased long. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course you had some interaction with with Dr. Com with Robert Com. Um, oh God! <laughs> um, and Abe Hesser. And Abe Hesser. Mm -hmm. uh, any any more to add about any, either of those gentlemen uh, before we move along? Other than that, they were just my nemesis, and yeah. so I spent time thinking about them. I think there's evidence now that indicates that they spent time thinking about me too, sure. and ways to to suppress my influence on the campus. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, Brad Brown and the influence that he had in your life, and James Riggs with the first uh, uh, Africa, uh, Af Black uh, History or Black Studies course. I'm sorry, Black Studies mm -hmm. course. Did you know Earl Mitchell when you were here uh, as a student? Yeah, because he uh, would, he arrived in the, in the mid '60s sometime. Mm -hmm. um, about uh, Earl arrived about '66 or '67, and because Brad was. Uh, great friends of both of us, he was the way I knew about Earl. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just wonderful to have a faculty member. One of the reasons we want to honor him is because I have been at six other universities and nobody ever had a 50 year uh, span in which uh, a professor or in, or an administrator or any staff that I know of that was connected with the university for 50 years. Uh, and so this is a resource. So we think honoring Dr. Mitchell will enable a lot of people to get over their pain, you know, caused by the university and be willing to, to come back. Mm 
It's, it's a it's a tenure uh, that few can match anywhere. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, uh, other personalities uh, or, or individuals you mentioned, uh, Margaret Williams. Uh, she was your uh, spouse. Yeah. Uh, for for part of this time. Uh, yeah. Um, Nimrod Chapel. Uh, what what can you tell us about Nimrod Chapel? Nimrod was probably the the in that group of most important activists of the 19, student activists of the 1960s. Nimrod had, um, had gone into the military before any of us had ever met him. And so he was a little older uh, than the rest of us. And he brought that worldly experience and sense of humor into the, um, the committee that I was talking about that was the nucleus of the uh, formation of the Afro-American Society. And so the trying to remember what about the other incidents, because there were some incidents that um, either I had a test or, you know, Margaret and I were engaged in something else or, you know, that, that Nimrod and Glenn, you know, were involved in. Our spouses... This is Glenn Schott. Yes, so, Glenn Schott. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, our spouses-to-be tended to support us, you know, what we were doing, and to make it more effective. And usually it would have been, they brought some skill to it that we were totally lacking in. Uh, or some thought of some strategy that, you know, we were totally lacking in. And it, 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 it just underscores the importance of men and women in, um, in innovative movements working together because they bring something completely different. So the, uh, so Nimrod went briefly to Langston and uh, then came here. And he was a person who was good with his hands, you know, technology and that kind of thing. Um, he indicates that he was the first person to graduate with his, his type of degree, who was African American at the university. And um, he was at everything that, and involved with everything that I was involved with. So the uh, Black Heritage Week um, that I did, he was involved in. The um, uh, wasn't involved with Ron Stevens because he and I didn't know each other at the time, and he was still in in uh, in the military. But uh, in the um, if. If Nimrod had not been involved with uh, the, the, the meeting with Dr. Khan, I'm not sure we would have done it. So, um, in fact, I'm pretty sure we wouldn't have done it. Um, and so I sort of needed him to be there because he had the experience so that if things in any way got out of hand, Nimrod would know what to do. And so during this time, he's the best person for certain things. You know, the, uh, the women had incredible skills, but this was kind of new to them too, and they were taken out of their worlds. They were women who were raised to be um, good women. 
and they were dependable. If they said they would be present, they were there, uh, even if they didn't know quite what was going to happen. Nimrod and I were more risk takers, and Nimrod was pro probably more risk taker than I was. Um, so he was one of those people who would uh, take students over to Wesley to me. And um, after the organization really got going, um, there was something which, which disappointed me in, I think, I'm not sure whether it was 1969 or 67. It was one of those two years. So we got together uh, and asked the students to join us, and about 30 or 35 students joined us to get the organization off the ground. Well, by now, by that time, by 67, I am trying to find everything out about San Francisco State University that I can. And so I, found, I find out some way that the name of the black student organization at uh, either San Francisco State or Berkeley is called the Black Liberation Front, the Black Student Liberation Front. So again, kind of naively, uh, and without doing spade work, I just assumed that this would be a wonderful name for the organization here. And there was a young woman who nobody uh, is able to identify who spoke that night that the meeting took place. Um, the title of her talk was, I Am a Negro. Now, all of us are so uh, politicized at this point that no name with Negro is going to make it through that group with our approval. And we're the ones who have called the meeting. After her speech, we look at each other and we say, well, it's not going to be Black Student <laughs> Liberation Front. And so that's how the name Afro-American Society came out as a name that was endorsed by the students. And I was disappointed. Uh, I'd been in, I'd been irate if we had come out of there with, with me. Uh, but, you know, it was good that it happened because they had a sense that, that it was their choice. And we, we could have tried to say that you know, we're still going to name it that way and would have, would have lost people had we, we done that. Right. But it was a discussion that was happening around the country. You know, Oklahoma State was uh, among the many schools that had that discussion. And uh, we, we resolved it in a way that was, that preserved the integrity of the process that said, no, we won't act like it's just us who uh, should make this important decision. This is uh, a decision that's important to have buy-in from the community, the student community. Did, did the women ever talk about uh, the discrepancies they had uh, as being women? Uh, because early on, uh, ours, the residence halls were different for women than men. Uh, there were a number of issues in which uh, the sexes were treated differently. Uh, did they ever talk about those things with you or, or share some of their frustrations or concerns? Unfortunately, we were in tune with the male chauvinism of the times. The movement had these contradictions built into it. That is one of the reasons why people tend to praise the Black Lives Matter uh, movement now. Um, but back then, it was about the women doing the real work of the organization and the men following. And, and I'm sorry, the men taking credit for it. And um, so 
I think they may have discussed these things, but it's one of the difficulties in my research right now. I have more successful men than successful women. And it doesn't feel like it's the right thing to me. But on the campus, too, I felt like it was the women like Margaret and Cynthia who tended to do the work, and then we tended to be the spokespeople for their work. Mm -hmm. And that was true of Glenn, too. He was also, I don't know any of the men who were on campus when I was here, who would have embraced this um, feminist model that many of, her, of, her, of us have become in later years. We didn't get it. Didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And that's why I praise this movement now, because they have involved uh, uh, sexual orientation, the women, several of the, well, some of the women who are in the leadership of Black Lives Matter are women who are lesbian and uh, who are, have different uh, sexual orientations um, than any of the rest of their, um, the people who, uh, who are around. So we were, um, the women typically allowed us to lead because they felt that that was what the movement was about. And when, when I find the, uh, the group that was able to build respect into what they are doing, I would be very happy to praise them because they were not the usual. Uh, were you involved with any other uh, off-campus groups? Um, uh, churches in town, uh, other organizations in the city, in the community of Stillwater, or was most of your activity really focused on campus? On campus. On campus. And uh, uh, so that was why the university, uh, uh, the, the uh, Unitarian uh, initiative that uh, uh, the preacher asked me to involve with. That's why it was so unusual. He asked me to, to do it. And uh, I don't remember how he convinced me because I know I was too busy to, to do it. But, um, you know, I probably was one of the few people who would have taken something like that. I don't even know how I'd heard of Malcolm Boyd at the time, but I had. Uh, heard of him and knew that he was a white liberal. Mm -hmm. um, but you were uh, developing uh, relationships, connections with individuals at other places. So either at, at San Francisco State or, I mean, you, you'd call, I guess, apparently. Uh, but so you were, you were aware of, of um, uh, other organizations or other groups uh, traveling a similar path with you at different institutions, weren't you? Only in a very generic way. Okay. Um, so, more than relationship forming, for me it was about information. Because I had such a limited stock of information that I'd never done this before. And so, um, my feeling was, what are you doing? You know, what, uh, what does black studies mean to you? What kind of courses are you te teaching that constitute black studies? But it's not to build relationships. I don't understand that value at that point. Uh, so that the woman who's going to speak tomorrow, uh, mm -hmm. that was one of her questions, you know, about, uh, uh, you know, the black student activism here on this campus. And I told her I never picked up a phone and never even thought to pick up a phone to call people at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, I should have. And it would have added to the impact of our movement had we done this. But, um, and I should probably ask Alonzo Batson, who was the 
the next really important, you know, heir of this legacy, uh, he was the leader who, who uh, managed the boycott. And uh, as I have learned the counts of uh, the boycott and uh, President Kahn being forced to meet with the students, that has been a great uh, uh, satisfaction to me that President Kahn, who would have uh, never met, you know, with us, had to meet with these students because the uh, governor asked him to, or demanded, and sent the helicopter. <laughs> Were you familiar with the incident where the sociology department uh, resigned uh, as a group? Yeah, that, that was that the one. Been, that, that was the one that was. So that's that. That was a part of this incident. That's right. right that's right. So they chose to do to start this protest because of of the uh, contradictions within the department, and um, that was the first time I remember that type of protest on. The campus. I've never, from 1961 to 69, I was not aware of anything like that. Mm -hmm. And so we still drew our support um, on the campus as student activists from other students. Mm -hmm. um, there, there were individual mentors for us, but we still, you know, relied upon student to mm -hmm. students. And the, I will say this. I think. The role of white students has been understated in terms of the history of change on the campus. Just as it, they supported Nancy Randolph Davis, I have to say that that I think I was supported. You, you know, the the willingness of people to once we got beyond our great power who was the hot potato and nobody mm -hmm. wanted to deal with him. But uh, they made, you, you know, the travel expenses available, which is some level of buy-in. Um, anything black is controversial at this point on the campus. So for them to provide uh, support when Abe Hesser would not have supported right. uh, is, uh, is an important step to me. Uh, they, there were more white students, and you know, just ignore the fact of the difference in populations, but there were more uh, white students in the first black studies class uh, than, than uh, black students. Uh, Patrick, you know, was popular among certain, he's the son of Professor James Rich. He was a white student that for a time, and I don't think it was that long, but he bridged white students and black students, and uh, at least insofar as he, he, uh, he got, he kept white students in, uh, at some level, aware of this uh, process of us creating or initiating the course. And so uh, I think their role uh, just is understated based upon what, uh, what, when I talk to others, uh, and that's true throughout the, seems to me true throughout the 50s and the 60s. And you would have expected white students to be the opposition. Are you familiar with an incident uh, in the library involving uh, black students? Uh, and the stacking of books in the stairwell? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know a lot about it, and I, as a black student, was not involved with that. Uh, but people do allude to, uh, to that. But there are people who know more uh, about that particular one than I did. It, it happened toward the end of the 60s. And in some ways, In some ways, I was uh, beginning to broaden my outreach. You know, the Vietnam, my Vietnam awareness comes later in the 60s. And I tended to get involved with those movements. 
the um, so that there are others who would be uh, much more knowledgeable than than I would be. Okay. I've never been able to determine the extent of that uh, activity, whether it was a, a few students and a few piles of books, or an extensive you know movement of material. I've never been able to determine. That at all. Yeah, Nimrod would have been a great. Okay. Uh, you know, source for us, but he passed earlier this year. Uh, but I can, I'm sure I can find somebody who would be willing to talk to you about yeah. that. From my, from, from, from what I've read so far, it was a fairly minor incident uh, that happened. Um, um, any other issues with uh, the OSU residence halls uh, while you were living there? Um, not for me. Um, after a certain point, I don't remember exactly I began to move off campus. And why did I move off campus? Uh, it just did not feel supported in a lot of the residence halls. Um, the white students who were the activists did not typically live in the residence halls. And so, I said, well, you know, maybe I should be off campus too. Mm -hmm. And um, so Jean Reed, who is here today, was one of my roommates uh, from that period where I was staying in off-campus housing. Um, I, so that I, I, not to my knowledge, you know. Um, you, you've alluded to some of your activities after you left OSU. Any, anything else you want to add about, about your life after, after Oklahoma State University? Well, I became involved with the Multicultural Center movement. And uh, in my view, why that, that, that movement is so important because of the, uh, the importance of the, the See what is it called? Co-curriculum movement, and the co-curriculum is everything that is done outside the classroom. The largest advantage that I think I gained at Oklahoma State University was in the area of the co-curriculum, and so it. What I learned at Oklahoma State University provided a basis for my uh, entire professional career. If someone had asked me, what qualifications do you have uh, in order to be director of a multicultural center? I could not say that there was classroom knowledge or a classroom framework or a disciplinary framework that I would have been part of um, I could not say that there was any, um, any organization that I was a member of that supported, you know, interest in the, uh, the co-curriculum. Yet, it's the co-curriculum that enabled me to know what I needed to know about uh, being a center director when I left in 69 to become the inaugural acting director of the Center for Black Studies at the University of California at Santa Barbara. And uh, if I had not had that, if I had not had the experience with college administrators that I learned, you know, dealing with Khan and Hesse, it would have been, I would have been totally out of my element. But because I had that experience, you know, I was able to give what I still think of today at the end of my career as a reasonably decent uh, performance uh, in a career that uh, is, is very challenging. Because uh, you, you are, in fact, an educator. It's just that you're doing so outside the framework of the curriculum. And um, there are still people like me around who think that the curriculum 
particularly in our times, because it just wasn't fitted for life in, in our world. Um, you know, one problem, of course, there's no black studies. But if you were Latino and here, if you were Native American and here, even if you were a woman and here, if you were Asian American and here, uh, if you were a gay student or a lesbian student or a questioning student, it would have been hard to find relevant material as to how you relate to your own uh, other significant community here at the University of Rhode Island, at, at Oklahoma State University, or at any other, you know, institution of higher education. So that's what those students at San Francisco State were saying to their college administration, that we're not prepared for the real world unless these courses are being taught and they should be respected and you should create a department for these courses in the same way that you've done for other ballot uh, curricula. Melvin, any other topics or subjects that I haven't, <laughs> haven't been uh, smart enough to, to, to raise with you or, or do you think we kind of finished for today? It's, I'll leave it in your court. How do you feel? So I'll summarize with uh, uh, one important thing. Okay. You know, um, my wife and I, we had a professional collaboration and um, she was certainly my best friend ever in life, you know, excluding my parents, of course. But um, my wife was someone who, after our experience here at the University of, at Oklahoma State University, she became director of uh, African American Studies and an associate professor uh, of Black Studies at um, the State University of New York at New Paltz. And as you and I have mentioned, she was an authority uh, and a linguistic scholar, but she was an authority on the life and history of Dr. Lorenzo Dow Turner. Dr. Turner was a specialist in the Gullah languages uh, and the Geechee lang languages of the Sea Islands uh, off the coast of uh, Georgia and South Carolina. And um, also, in general, the first widely respected academic linguist of African American ancestry in the country. And um, so that would have not happened without Langston and the and Oklahoma State University. It needed both of those experiences. But if they had been separate from each other, I don't think she would have done it without Oklahoma State. And so, um, and that's not just the fact that we met each other, but it's because of those experiences again. Um, we needed to be able to Inter interact with administrations and then to work out the problems of negotiation when you are strategically asymmetrical with each other. The other person has the, the largest share of the power and the question that needs to happen is how do you change the universe uh, that you both are part of so that you're able to make it a profitable experience for you both. And uh, Margaret and I were able to do that. And uh, after all these years, I've learned that uh, Oklahoma State University did that for us. Uh, when you leave, uh, 
you don't think about these things. And it's only after reflection that, the, that you see the significance of them. Um, Margaret and I never talked about them, but I know her well enough to know that, um, that she would have um, agreed with, with that assessment. Um, I was able then to, um, to work with her in Omaha, Nebraska to uh, develop a Black Studies Department. Um, she changed the landscape at New Paltz, at State University of New Paltz, New York, in the same way, or in a similar way, to the influence of uh, Dr. Uh, Earl Mitchell here at the University of, um, of, at Oklahoma State University. And what it suggests to me is that, to some degree, I was wrong in my approach. That I thought it was important to, to be present at a lot of the universities. She, I think, functioned best when she could put roots down at a university. And between Earl and Margaret, uh, who just had such an enormous impact on their institutions, that there should be uh, a recognition now of this model, you know, for uh, change agents. That, um, you know, more consideration should be given to what happens when people decide to make a stand and to overcome and absorb the momentum of racism, sexism, classism, and other isms in order to help an institution develop itself. And both Margaret and Earl made that type of commitment. And uh, I respect that model more because of what they've been able to do. There's a certain uh, institutional memory that people with longevity can bring to the table because of their experience over a long period of time. That's right. That's right, and in some sense, we're calling upon that for this this uh, restricted period. You know that uh, I am back. You know, um, and that hopefully next year there will be so many others. You know, returning to talk about the fifties and sixties, and if you can engage that memory then there are potential benefits for everybody, especially in the area of, of healing. And not just for the people who were um, in some ways the victims, but uh, from everybody, you know, there's potential healing uh, that can be done. And I know some of that healing has already taken place this, this weekend. I have uh, people um, who said, as much. Thank you very much, Melvin. I hope you will contact us next year uh, and maybe consider some individuals uh, willing to talk with us uh, with uh, the Oral Histories program here at Oklahoma State University. Oh, so. absolutely, absolutely. So I'll start working on that okay. since, as you know, part of uh, the project is, in fact, to, uh, to publicize the uh, and to publish the bios of certain people. So we should talk about that. Okay, we will. Thank you, yeah. Thank you Melvin.